A lot of amateurs, including builders, use modern DDS VFOs to control the frequency of their transmitter or receiver. But there's still an elegant simplicity in a one transistor crystal oscillator. Not only is it simple, but it's easy to build, uses few parts, and gives a pure sine wave output. The main problem though is frequency agility, and even if you only need to operate on a single frequency, then the frequency that your crystal may be on may not be your desired operating frequency. Generations of amateurs have encountered that problem. In the old days, with larger type crystals in the FT243 case, you could open up the crystal, grind its quartz element, and change its frequency. Grinding tended to increase the crystal's frequency. A good video describing how to do this is available on YouTube. So uh, what I discovered, this is my own innovation, was I use 600 grit wet or dry sandpaper. What about more modern, smaller size crystals? Unlike the old FT243s, you can't open their case. Instead, you need to use a hacksaw. Fortunately, that's quite easy, and I have yet to damage a crystal. Though, as you'll see later on, I have with other experiments. I was lucky enough to buy a bag of 50 crystals from Rockby Electronics. You can still buy them from Rockby, but they come in bags of 25 rather than 50. Apart from a bag of crystals that you're happy to expend in the name of science, you also need a mitre box, a block of wood, and a hacksaw. Plus, a crystal oscillator circuit, like this. Just one transistor, three resistors, and a few capacitors. The values aren't particularly critical. But with this oscillator, you'll be able to test to see if the crystal that you are grinding still works, and also to generate a signal, so its signal can be heard on a receiver. You want access to almost all of the crystal element. So you want to position your hacksaw blade about three or four millimeters above where the pins come out. You make a cut on one side, then on the other, then you hold the crystal so you make a cut on its ends as well. There'll still be a few fragments of metal holding the cap on. So you just use some side cutters like this to nibble around the sides and then with care, you'll be able to lift it off. Just be careful, as the crystal inside is very fragile. When you make the cut, the crystal looks like this. It's a sandwich, quartz in the middle, and two plates either side. One plate is connected to one pin, and the other plate to the other. As I mentioned before, the quartz is very fragile. I tried various things, like using these side cutters, to nick bits out of it, but often the crystal would stop working. I also used a small file to file away some of the quartz in this element. But again, it was very easy to crack and destroy the crystal. My first experiment was to get a hobby knife and try and make a cut along here. The idea is the surface area of the plate would be smaller and the resonant frequency of the crystal would change. In the end, I didn't make a cut, though there was an impression clearly visible where the metal was shiny. That did change the frequency, but not in the direction that I expected. What I suspect happened is that the two plates were pushed closer together, and that reduced the frequency of the crystal. The next thing I did as you'll see later with a lot of success, was to tear off a small strip of sandpaper and sand each side of the crystal. Just the two metal circles that connect to the pins of the crystal. What we found was the frequency shift changed direction. Instead of going below, it's gone above, up to 6479, i.e. about 6 kilohertz above where we started. This is after about 100 rubs per side. As you might just be able to see, a little bit of the plating seems to have eroded. This indicates that it's very thin indeed. We'll keep rubbing 
and see how high we can get this crystal. 50 strokes either side got us even higher, up to 6487. That is 14 kilohertz above where we started. I didn't wear away very much, but we're now up to 6490. I've gone a bit too far, and now the crystal has died. But not before moving 17 kilohertz above where I was originally. Now with another crystal, unmodified, it's 6.4725. I've got a 2B lead pencil. And I'll just scribble on one side. And as you can hear, the frequency has changed. I've dropped it by 600 hertz. What I'll now do is Scribble on the other side. And it's dropped further. 6.4712 or 1.3 kilohertz below where I started. I'll do a bit more scribbling. The lowest I can get with the pencil is about 6.469. That's 3.5 kHz below where we started. That's not a very big frequency excursion, but it could still be useful. We've learnt a few things in this video. First of all, even if a crystal is in a small case, it is possible to open it. With care, you can even make changes to the crystal to shift its frequency. Most useful is increasing the crystal's frequency by carefully sanding away both sides of the crystal. The increase obtained can be as much as 15 kilohertz at 6 megahertz, or even if you take care somewhat higher. Or if you want to reduce a crystal's frequency, then you can use a lead pencil, scribble on it, and the frequency will drop a few kilohertz. I haven't measured the long and short term stability, and if you're going to be using this type of crystal in equipment, then you'll most likely need something to reduce shock, given that we've removed the case.